our first stock that we launched in 2006 was a negative comb rifle stock. The LR1000 that launched Gunworks, that was a negative comb rifle stock. And we've, we kind of didn't talk about it really that openly for maybe like, I don't know, eight years, ten years. And only in the last few years, as people have started to copy it, have we gone ahead and started mentioning what it is. Because if you look, Fierce, like Fierce literally handed over one of our rifle stocks to their guys and said, copy this stock. You know, you got Axial Precision, they've copied it. One of our engineers went over to Weatherby. Guess what? Weatherby finally got away from that stupid freaking cone they were doing, copied our design geometry. So we've seen that start to go everywhere, and you will see everybody will adopt it, like it because it is the superior methodology. And, and what we'll also see, hopefully, is we'll, we'll, we'll have a realization as an, as an industry that for 90% of the cases that people – use adjustable cheek pieces for what they're doing is they're supporting bad shooting techniques and behaviors so anytime i see an adjustable cheek piece i'm like well that guy doesn't know how to shoot now that might not be true <laughs> yep. welcome to the shoot to hunt podcast with your host ryan avery a registered democrat who loves the 65 creed more and the Jacob Moshani, his beard is made of the gypsy pubes. But together, they make the number four podcast in all of the US and A a great success. It is a nice. That music goes, that music goes a while. Have, yeah, we're supposed to start talking before it ends there. All right, we well, have. Who, who did this voice? Who did the voice? That's it's our it's know. our our new marketing manager named Luke here. He's got a he's got a multitude of voices at his disposal. So we're gonna play with them and figure out what works. Yeah, he's uh, I guess he's somewhat talented. <laughs> I don't know if he's special or talented. <laughs> the first the first Borat movie though is definitely worth a watch if you uh, if you want kind of some dumb humor. Yeah, very dumb, very crude humor. Yeah. All right, today on the show, we have the one and only, very polarizing guest, Aaron Davidson from Gunworks. Aaron, welcome to the show. I didn't realize I was polarizing. (laughs) (laughs) When did this happen? (laughs) What I appreciate about you is you're probably the only, are you the CEO of Gunworks? Is that the correct term? Yeah. You're the only. Well, I mean, it's kind of, it's like, it's. Uh, it's a self-proclaimed title. I didn't actually get the job of CEO. I just named myself CEO. It could have been anything. So. <laughs> uh, kind of well, bullshit. Well, I, be- I imagine in the beginning you were the CEO, janitor, dishwasher. You were you were all of it. Founder, probably all of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I lost my train of thought there, but uh, polarizing. You're the only. Well, you're going to you. Yeah, ahead. you're going to tell me how I became polarizing. Oh yes. You're the only, and I would say you're, you know, incorporation or you, your size, uh, Gunworks is size. You're the only CEO that I've ever seen get on Rock Slide and actually get down in the mud and talk shit with people, <laughs> which I respect. I do respect that. Have, have I talked shit with anybody? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't. I don't know what you call it. I would call it. <laughs> you're not passive aggressive. You ask questions. You don't, you're not in there just putting out opinion. You are asking them to, you know, state and show facts, which to me, I appreciate. Well, we had that exchange on the, that last, uh, that last um, forum, which by the way, I really appreciate your forum. And I, I really like the guys that are out there. There's some pretty sharp guys on the forum. It's, it's been, um, you know, there's always been the longrangehoney.com and the other ones, but mm-hmm. I've just recently, over the past few years, started using yours, and it's great. It's a great place to gather information. So, just putting that out there. But there, we had that little exchange with that guy that that said I that I was an arrogant asshole, and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You must have me mixed up with somebody else. That, <laughs> that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> and I, I, I do. I still think he has me mixed up with somebody else. And I kept asking him, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, like show me this post or show me this other thing that you're referencing. Cause I think we're not, I don't think I'm who you think that I am. So. I would agree. You know, you don't know this, but I met you probably way back in like the best of the West days, like before, you know, Gunworks was a thing and you've never, 
you've never been anything but nice and you've answered all my questions and you didn't know me from Adam. So I don't know. I'm not here to, to fluff you up, but you've never, you've never, ever not answered my question. And you, I've never seen you arrogant asshole. I don't know. I mean, we could probably ask your employees. They may have a different opinion of you, but I've never seen it. Yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think we'll keep my wife out of the conversation. Cause <laughs> my... All right. Let's jump in these questions. Cause uh, I don't want to waste your waste all day. Um, when I did a tour, when I went down and shot the Nexus, um, we got the, uh, shop tour from Dustin Whitwer and, uh, he told me, and I talked to Land about this, you guys shoot, not your standard three shot, you know, we shoot a half minute guarantee, whatever at a hundred yards, you guys have a back to back seven shot group that has to be under three quarter minutes. Can you tell us about that? And why, why not the three shot group? The, you know, the, go ahead. Well, I mean, there's, there's reasons and reasons. Let's just. Let's start with let's start with uh, statistical significance. If if you if you shoot a three shot group, that's not the same thing as shooting a seven shot group. The more shots that you shoot, the more significant the data set is. So if if you're going to shoot a three shot group, you might want to shoot say you know three or four or five three shot groups to get a sense of you know the significance of the data that you have, um, and and. So just leave it there. Seven shots, like that's as ten shots is better. Seven shots is good enough to really know what you have, and to back it up with a second group of seven proves it. Basically, you have to have a proof group. And what what I'm trying to do there with our team uh, is is know exactly what the gun does, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you got a guy on a on a sheep hunt, and you know, he checks his he checks his three shots on the paper in, in camp, and they shoot pretty good. And that fourth shot's out when it's the moment of truth. But it's a fail. Like, who cares if it's shot a sub half inch three shot group? It's a fail. So, to me, what we're really trying to do is make sure we don't have flyers. You know, we're we're proving ammo at the same time we're proving guns. If you think about it, so no flyers. And we're making sure that nobody's cheated. You know, there's no fluke that passes a gun. And if, if you go back to some or, origination story on this, we used to shoot a lot of three-shot groups. Had, a, had a, a, a guy working for me that was a hell of a rifle shot, did a great job. And, you know, and my brother, you know, working for me, again, hell of a rifle shot, you know. And you go out and you shoot a three-shot group, and it was great. And then you take that same gun out, and all of a sudden you shoot this group that's not – you know, three eighths minute. And so, so I, I asked those guys, well, why don't you try an exercise and take your piece of paper, your target paper and put 10 targets on there and shoot 10 three shot groups out of that gun and bring it back to me and show me what we got. And th- those guys had some quarter MOA groups on that, but they had some groups that were pushing an inch or over as well. Gotcha. And I said, this is why this is why we can't shoot a three shot group is because this three shot group does not tell us the story about this gun. Yeah. Is is that back to back group? Is that do you let that barrel cool down or is that back to back? The seven shots are fired consecutively with no more than a minute between shots. And my guys are pushing a lot of guns through this, so they don't want to dick around. I mean, it's generally you just sit down and shoot seven shots. Gotcha. Um, you know, we'll run, we'll run some fans in there and we'll try to deal with Mirage. You know, we circulate a lot of air through our inside. We have an inside shooting tunnel. Mm-hmm. So we, we move a lot of air to eliminate the big low frequency loop Mirage, but then we also push a lot of air across the barrels you know, and, and suppressors if we're shooting with suppressors in there so that yeah, you can get the Mirage out of your, you know, your uh, sight picture. And then that sec- shoot pretty fast. That second follow up. The second one, they'll let the gun cool off a little bit. Not cold, but they'll let it cool off a little bit. They'll shoot another gun and then they'll come back to it and shoot it again. It's interesting because Jake, unknown munitions, they do a lead load dev on their rifles and you can send in a rifle. And um, they have found that shooting the three shot group at 100 yards and say it's a 0.4 does, definitely doesn't correlate <clears throat> to a 650 yard shot. And now, now they shoot the th- the hundred yard shot, and then they move out, and they they verify it at six fifty, and it's pretty eye opening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Statistics, man. I think that's probably one of the weakest places that 
it's still in our in our industry. If you look back when we started Gunworks, like guys really didn't understand long range. Like they didn't really understand precision rifles. And I mean, state of the art was a 3378 Weatherby with a 130 grain Barnes bullet shooting as fast as you can make it, guessing holdovers with reticles. That I mean, that was that was like the Stone Ages, man. And if you look at how smart and savvy a lot of people are now about the way ballistics work and the way systems work, you know, and, and we want to claim a lot of credit there, you know, we want to, we want to say that we did, that we did a lot there. Yeah. I, I think you have but, a lot there. But, but the whole industry's the whole industry's got smart, but statistics, right? Like uh, bleeding data and lean, leaning on data. Do you guys want to know why we have a shortage of ammo and powder the military no shit no it's all these guys out there and i'm going to try not to cuss it's all these guys out there that believe that believe in ladder testing every one of these guys out there that's just pissing away bullets and powder you know doing these magical ocw tests you know where you take this one shot and then you take another shot of a different load or another seating depth and somehow you're going to interpret this data you, you can't do it that way. I, this is an area in our industry, right, in, in the knowledge level of our, um, you know, market, let's say, where we're a little bit behind. And, and we're getting there. And I think I've, I've started to see a lot of pretty savvy guys start pushing the concept that those things don't work because the data that you're recording is not statistically significant. So hopefully – you know, we catch up, and then maybe all that wasted powder will be available for people that are actually just going to load shit that works and, you know, do stuff with it. What What is the Aaron Davidson School of Reloading? How do you do your not ladder tests? Dude, it's actually pretty easy, but maybe, maybe you know, maybe maybe I'm oversimplifying. You, you got to start with some good brass. So, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna say you have to have good components because. There's no magic in, you know, saving, you know, a bad barrel or a bad chamber or a bad piece of brass or a bullet that's not, you know, weighted right or powder that's dog shit. Mm -hmm. So let's just, let's start with, start with good components and good work because I I don't know how to deal with that other shit because we just don't do that. So start with good components. So if you take any good barrel, good chamber, good piece of brass, and you size the brass correctly, so that means that you have reasonable neck tension. It's not that sensitive, but some, let's say somewhere between one and a half and two and a half thousandths of neck tension on your bullet. So, and the brass isn't too long and it's chamfered. So, boom, set the brass aside. That's done. And then you have, um, and I'm I'm t- talking new. If you're going to do, if you're remanufacturing stuff, that's there's other contingencies there you take a bullet that's good you know stick it over a good load of powder and you seat that bullet 25,000 off the land it's going to shoot good and all we're really doing is seeing where the pressure is in your gun combination powder brass etc that works for you and i'm not a big fan of hot rod stuff i think it's it's kind of lame i think it's so much easier to use a ballistic solver than to try to chase that last 50 feet per second that it's just not worth it. So I'll do a conservative load, but I don't want to leave a bunch on the table. So I'm going to take half grain increments and I'm going to load starting at those starting loads or below. And I'm just going to keep loading up until I start seeing pressure signs. I'll pull back a half grain. I'm 25,000 off the lands. Guess what? That load's going to shoot. It's, it's done it a thousand times. That load's going to shoot. So unlike say on your seven shot, your, your groups, how quick are you if that's not falling into that three-quarter minute, are you to pull that barrel? Like, how quick does that happen? Um, so usually they'll, they'll put a, a, some rounds through just making sure everything's working, you know, zero on a scope. So they might have, say, 10 rounds in the gun before they try that first seven-shot seven group. Gotcha. So they're going to know, they're going to know within, you know, 20, 30 rounds. Now, if it doesn't pass, you know, then you, you don't just reject the barrel. You say, okay, here's the checklist of the 10 things that are going to cause a problem. Let's just go through one more time and make sure 
before we have a freak out here. And so they'll, they'll usually run that pass through a little QC check. And, you know, most of the time we save it. Now, I'll tell you, man, we started doing barrels a couple years ago. We don't have a lot of guns that don't pass. Like before that, you know, you'd get these waves and batches of barrels that would just, you know, just not quite cut the mustard. But where it's at right now, like we don't question barrels very often. Once in a while, you know, we might take a look at the lapping or something, but it's pretty high yield rate. I was going to kind of bring this up in the Nexus rifle, but you guys are predominantly just selling carbon barrels. I know you make some still, but you guys are mostly just yeah. pushing out carbon barrels. Yeah, the, the, we basically let the market dictate, and that's what the market said. So we're we're on board. I mean, we figured out how to make a carbon barrel that doesn't suck, and so <laughs> it's fine with us. I like it. I personally, I think aesthetically, it's it's very pleasing. I like to run a suppressor. I think it mates very nicely with a suppressor. N- not to it works for me. Not to jump into your process, but is it proprietary patented? How you do your carbon barrels, or is it? Have you? No, no, it's not. I mean, it's we don't just go advertise with everybody how we're doing it, but a filament wound composite structure is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we do a f- couple things that have we've developed that help us manufacture nicely, so that's important. Um, you know, develop a special autoclave. We, you know, use a, a, a very specific type of, of material and and then we've developed a pretty cool way to get the contour right when we're done. So we're, we like it. We think that there's still improvements in the manufacturing process and we can always make stuff better, but we've been wrapping barrels with carbon for about five years now. So it's, we've been, we've owned that piece for quite a long time. You're taking it from steel all the way to the carbon wrap process. Yeah. Yeah. We get, we get raw drill now, okay. drill it, you know, the whole works. I wasn't going to bring up the Nexus yet, but I'll, I, we're talking about barrels, so I'll jump in there. I got that Nexus rifle probably three weeks ago, and I, I literally shot six rounds to zero it, got the muzzle velocity, and then I went out. And this is factory one or factory one forty seven ELD match, and uh, I shot it at six fifty, and it was a three and a half inch group at six fifty. So I literally had ten rounds down the barrel, and I already shot a three and a half inch group at six fifty. That to me, that's pretty damn impressive, dude. I, I, I... I'm, I always like to understand everything that's going on around me, and sometimes I'm a little boneheaded. We had a weird chambering variance that took me eight years to finally understand, but I do. I understand it now, thank goodness. Um, the Nexus, we did some things very specifically that we knew would enhance its inherent precision, but there's something about that gun, man, that I just I haven't been able to put my finger on. I don't know. The stock geometry is close to what our normal systems run, but it feels better than a, a regular gun. I, I just I haven't been able to put a finger on it, and it shoots better than a normal gun. Now I have. There are a few things about the normal gun that you know it has against it, like a 60 degree V thread in a rifle action. A lot of people don't understand this, but for most of your Magnum hunting cartridges, that barrel joint cannot cannot maintain its tension in all conditions. And what that means is that the axial load of your bullet and case expansion and the forces that are imp- imparted into your receiver and, and your barrel, the actual loads there can exceed the tension that you're able to put on that barrel, the axial preload, when you tighten it up. So Mm. literally that barrel comes loose and goes tight, comes loose and goes tight every time you shoot. So if you ever wondered why a scope ring that goes to the top of your receiver, if it ever touches that barrel, it absolutely doesn't shoot. That's why, because that joint's moving Mm. and that joint has to return and it's a, it's a 60 degree V thread, so that means it's kind of like a cone. So it kind of wants to return to the same spot every time. But this is this is one of the reasons why we went C and C, you know, 15 years ago on um, barreling rifles. You got a you got a uh, an operator that's running a manual lathe right now, and there's a lot of guys that make great guns that do this, but they're running a manual lathe. 
you can only thread it, say, like 150 RPMs. So you throw a carbon fiber type insert in there, thread 150 RPMs, you're tearing the steel. So the microsurface on the steel is rough. You go put that in our machine and we're thread that say like 12 or 1400 RPM. When that, when those threads come off, it is shiny. And I know a lot of the, a lot of the gunsmiths that have been able to get just a little bit bigger, they've invested in CNC as well. I mean, I think we've got a million views on our YouTube video that we put out way over a decade ago that showed people how we use CNC to chamber rifles. But if that thread form is slightly rough, will that barrel joint go back together as good every time? Does that does not? And it doesn't. And it doesn't. So, so there's all sorts of little things you can do to make a normal style rifle work better, but tightening it up more doesn't work because you'll yield the material on your threads. You'll yield the material on the shoulder of your receiver. They just they can't stand up to a, 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 tor- a torque because you're only carrying all that load on the first two and a half, three threads of the of the setup. If you change the thread form in our in our barrel extensions on a Nexus, that thread form is a ramp thread which distributes the load across all the threads in the barrel, and it doesn't come loose. And if you combine that with the way our you know that quick change barrel system works and the barrel clamp system. Like that barrel joint doesn't move. So we've eliminated one of those really small things that can cause issues in those other rifles. I'm pretty ignorant to the gunsmithing side. That's more Jake's genre. I'm pretty I am just a shooter. So when you do that switch barrel, are you head spacing that off of that barrel extension or is it does it head space off of a bolt? I am ignorant to it. Can you kind of explain? When that? we when we ch- when we chamber the barrel in the factory, we chamber the barrel to the barrel extension. Gotcha. And so when you when you have when you get any barrel from us, it works with any bolt head because all that stuff is machined in a way that is consistent. Hmm. And people so that you, so you don't have to headspace. You just have to put it in, put it out. Like if the bolt closes, it's done. Oh, really? So and it's and it is that simple. It's basically those two little yeah. bolts on the Yep, T T25s, T25s, man. Loosen them up, swap the barrel, tighten them up, done. For somebody that's never heard of the Nexus, you know, and going from, you know, steel or titanium to aluminum and locking up on the barrel instead of the actual action, can you kind of describe what you guys did and why? Um, there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, uh, let's, just, let's just go with the easy ones. Aluminum's really easy to work with. Uh, we bar feed those receivers in our shop. And one machine finishes that entire action in one setup, and they drop out done, ready to go. So that, to me, eliminates all the multiple machine, multiple step, multiple setups, you know, the quality QC issues that come from that. Um, That machine will run unattended. It can make one of those receivers in about an hour and 25 minutes. So, So aluminum is nice to work with, nice to machine, and we achieve the weight properties that we're looking for without the expense of titanium. Titanium is very volatile as a material. Um, We do titanium actions in our Remington platform guns. It's very volatile. Uh, It screws up brooches. It causes issues with supply chain all the time. I mean, our our titanium costs have tripled over the last five years. It's, It's so we we're trying to get away from titanium. So we can do what we want with it. It achieves the weight properties we're looking for, and it, we are able to keep the cost down. That rifle's 5400 bucks. Like a gunsmith that assembles just generic components and sells it is going to be almost that much money or more. Yeah, that was the interesting part when we were down there because Landon, or I think it was Landon, asked me how much I thought it cost, and I was like, you know, looking at the price of the Gunworks products, I was like, ah, eight or nine grand. He's like, oh, you're going to yeah. be surprised. So 5,400 was, is surprising. And that's just the amount of time and parts and labor, right? Is cut down. So you're passing that on the consumer, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, like everybody, this is, I, and I'll take it, I'll take it. But this whole bullshit narrative that Gunworks is expensive is stupid. It really is stupid. Like, unless you're some dude who says that his time to go set up a gun, you know, 
unless you're a dude that says his time is only worth $10 an hour, our stuff costs the same as everybody else's stuff, period. And the truth is, think about what you get when you pay the money for a Gunworks rifle. So not only do you get a rifle that's great, right, and and is proven to work well, but you get the backing and support of a company that is unwilling to have an unsatisfied customer. Yeah. We've had to fire some customers before, but generally, like, we just take care of people, man. So we... So there's that. And then look at what we do for the industry. Like, look at the products that we develop and bring to the industry. You don't see these little gun shops doing that. And the truth is they don't have overhead. They don't have 85 people working for them, right? They're not supporting families like that. They're not investing in R&D. Like, they're not, they're not contributing back to the long-range shooting community the way that we do. And if you look at the profit margin those guys make on those assembly guns, they make a hell of a lot more money than we do. Hmm. Like those guys, those guys, and not trying to be critical here, but those guys are a lot more takers than what Gunworks is. You're talking so, there's, I, I mean, there's, I don't mind. Go ahead. Yeah, they're, they're, they're doing vacations in Mexico. <laughs> I'm freaking working here on a Saturday. <laughs> Right. There's a there's a big difference between, you know, what we've we've decided to do and what we've decided to invest in and what we've decided to give back to. So our customers know that when they buy from us, they get new innovative things like the Nexus, where all of a sudden the, the value price, you know, features, you know, really add up to something special or they get something like, you know, the BR4, you know, monocular rangefinder that beats anything on the market. Right. You know, or they get the next thing or the next thing. Like on the Nexus rifle, there's a lot of people throwing a lot of information around that they have. They have no idea what the actual answer is. When you built that from the ground up, did you get away from you know, Remington 700 clone? You know, to, in my opinion, the Achilles Hill is that trigger. Did you go uh, totally away from the 700 trigger or does it have a common 700 how this sits on the sear trigger? No, it, it doesn't. It's got a vertical sear. Gotcha. So you're not going to have the problem of, you know, freezing right before dark and then all of a sudden your rifle doesn't freaking fire. <laughs> That's probably a trigger manufacturer issue, not a style issue. But there's some pros and cons on the Remington 700 style. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to get away from that trigger style for a long time. So, you know, here we are. We'll see. We'll see how that works for us over time. But um, so far, we've been pretty happy. We've used Trigger Tech as our trigger guys since the very first trigger they made there. We tested those and we've used everybody's stuff. We tested their triggers and like, absolutely there's an advantage for a field trigger. Have they been perfect? No. More perfect than anybody else we've used? Yes. Gotcha. And I, and I got to talk about the negative comb because I pretty much shot a climber, Landon shed us a climber. And uh, the first time I ever shot it, I was like, Ooh, Ooh, this is different. Dude, we kept this under wraps for over a decade. Literally, we pioneered this stock ge design geometry, and we created a product that d didn't look like a McMillan A3. That's what everybody else felt like they had to do to make a long-range rifle, is it had to look like a McMillan A3. So all the stocks that everybody were designed were kind of copies of that. And, you know, we basically said, you know, that's my approach. It's an engineering approach. What's the problem, you know, what are the factors involved? How do we solve this problem? And how do we optimize it? And so if, you, if you're willing to go back to first principles, you can achieve some cool stuff. And that's where our stock design geometry came from, is just a, a really uh, granular understanding of the way the stock and the user interface, the way the system works. And even our first stock that we launched in 2006 was a negative comb rifle stock the LR-1000 that launched Gunworks. That was a negative comb rifle stock. And we've, we kind of didn't talk about it really that openly for maybe like, I don't know, eight years, 10 years. And only in the last few years, as people have started to copy it, have we gone ahead and started mentioning what it is. Because if you look fierce, like fierce literally handed over one of our rifle stocks to their guys and said, copy this stock. You know, you got axial precision, they've copied it. 
One of our engineers went over to Weatherby. Guess what? Weatherby finally got away from that stupid freaking comb they were doing, copied our design geometry. So we've seen that start to go everywhere, and you will see everybody will adopt it, like it because it is the superior methodology. And, and what we'll also see, hopefully, is we'll, we'll, we'll have a realization as an, as an industry that for 90% of the cases that people – use adjustable cheek pieces for what they're doing is they're supporting bad shooting techniques and behaviors. So anytime I see an adjustable cheek piece, I'm like, well, that guy doesn't know how to shoot. Now that might not be true. (laughs) It might not be true, but that's my thought because if you, if you use, if you actually use your cheek as the anchor point, you don't know how to shoot. And, and, adjustable cheeks so that your cheek is touching is just supporting bad habits. And it actually, it actually makes a bad, it's, it's a bad situation. It's a bad system. You, you can get away with a lot of stuff. If you're shooting 16, 18 pound precision rifle guns, like fine, maybe, maybe you can get away with a lot of stuff. But if, if you actually do, you know, hunting rifles, hunting cartridge, hunting weights, and you do hunting setups, it's absolutely, there's no place for it. So I think we'll see a lot more negative comb. We'll see a lot fewer adjustable cheek pieces as they continue to follow, you know, kind of the trends that we set, which is here's why we don't use adjustable cheek pieces. Just, you know, switch your shooting form and anchor correctly. So and, I, and I'm starting to see some more of that. This is why I say you're polarizing, Aaron. Um, the the negative comb part of it when you're saying people well, are hold using... on a sec I'm not po- I'm not polarizing all I, I am I am enlightening <laughs> that's not polarizing that's What's true polarizing is all the people that are too stupid to accept and follow along now that was arrogant no oh, there <laughs> but 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 seriously I'm not polarizing I'm I'm telling you like the way things work dropping you know wisdom bombs and like the smart guys, are, they'll jump on board. Well, you, you've already converted me because I sh- I had a 6.5 PRC. I put that climber on one, and then I had the identical. It was within a couple ounces, and I could literally spot, spot my hits with the climber at 300 yards, and I couldn't I even begin to spot my hits. The other I know. One. But see, see, the proof's in the pudding, right? I mean, I could be totally full of shit, but all you have to do is you shoot it, and, like, the light bulb comes on. So it's really easy to prove or disprove that it's a line of bullshit or not. And it's not. So, well, and you listen, because when I did my review, they said the only thing I would change is make a vertical pistol grip and bam, you came out with the Nexus. So you guys listen to. Well, now, now if you go look at the climber Magnus verdict, those three stocks, I I like designing systems. Mm -hmm. So I'm a systems guy. You look at those three stocks. Each one of those stocks has a slight change in the toe angle and the grip angle, each one of those. So the climber's a little more back, and then you got a little bit more vertical on the ver- uh, Magnus and a little more vertical on the verdict. You look at the toe line, it's a little steeper on the climber, a little flatter, a little flatter as you go. Now, why do we do that? Well, what are you using the climber for? It should be used for a mountain hunt. A mountain hunt is the most likely hunt to have a really weird, awkward shooting position, which means you need to have the gun needs to be more open right? And, and more flexible for how you get into that gun. So that's why that grip is a little bit more open. It's a little more forgiving for all the different types of conditions you'll see. So if you go look across the board on those systems, there's very, very considerate, you know, design effort that, that essentially creates those individual stocks. And the shooting experience for each one of those is slightly different and it's also tailored very specifically to the type of shooting that you do. Our sophistication in design is so much beyond what most people understand in this space. We know, we know so much more than what we talk about or show. You have to shoot to experience it. And even then, like you buy from us and you get a product, like you will find little cookies of awesomeness as you use that product and as you, you learn and grow and kind of kind of mold to that product over time. Fair enough. What do we got to get to get a Tika inlet on a climber? 
Um, you know what? Uh, I, this funny story. Uh, Chris, my one of my outside sales guys, he's he's got somebody harping for wanting to do a component stock there. I said, hey, here's what it's going to take. I need a quantity, a commitment for quantity, and then I need to I need 12 months. And then the last thing is it's all contingent on the the fit. I've never tried to put one there to see if all the dimensions are right. You don't realize how how different the tangs are, the placement of the of the you know the the bolt, the magazine systems, etc. So we just need to see, look at the fit and see if the fit's there. Um, if the fit's there, there's some there's some possibility. So so you're saying there's a chance is what I'm getting. <laughs> yeah, that this isn't the response I told Chris in private. It was a little bit it was a little <laughs> bit more de- de- Debbie Downer, but uh, yeah, there's a chance. Is is it a qual a quantity thing that has hitting a certain number? To make it worth your while, obviously. Uh, a little bit. It is a little bit. Um, it is a little bit. But it's mostly about I'm not going to take the time. I have three stock designs mm-hmm. that are next-gen stock designs that I can't get done. Right. Like, there, I, I, have a, I have probably 300 engineering projects that are outstanding. Hmm. So, so if I have to do new molds and new tooling and new process development – it would get put on a back burner that would be pretty deep. If, if all we have to do is a block and inletting, like, okay, this is, this is achievable. This is something we could take on. Okay. So I, I actually told Chris I'm going to do a little research for him, and I'll find out. So if we can make it happen, stay in touch. We'll see what it, what it does. If, if we can't, then you'll never see it. What, do you, what are you lacking to have 300 engineering projects awaiting I just need more engineers, man. I, I can, I have so many things that I want to do that it's just, it's absolutely frustrating to not be able to move more products through the system and, and, and get there. But we have, I, I have eight guys that are pretty awesome. I mean, you, you guys might not realize this, but we're not like a, like these other optics companies where they basically outsource to the OEMs all of their design work. We do all of our mechanical design and we do all of our electrical circuit design. We do all of our firmware and we do all of our software. So all of our ballistic algorithm development, we do that. Like all of the, the firmware that goes in any of these electronic products, we do that. And it, not like physical mechanical things, software is so crazy. You think about the validation you have to do, say in this rangefinder, when we, when we do a change and you have to go validate the rangefinder, You have to validate things that you take for granted. Like, for example, when you go enter a number, you validate that it goes from one to two and from two to three and three to four, right? It doesn't go three to seven. Like, you have to go into the minutia so deep that it it almost drives you crazy trying to bring one of those products up. And uh, I, it's pretty intense. So a very, very big part of our engineering group focuses on Revic optics and we just don't I just need a couple more mechanical guys and can you imagine a cooler job than to design stuff in Cody Wyoming like everybody got tags results today it's like half those people drew tags that are awesome like and the other half or go hunt some general areas what a cool place we just we just need more guys so is, is on that note is your engineers I mean obviously software engineers and different kinds of engineers but is Revic and gun work split up on the en- engineering side, or are they all working on the same yes. basic? Okay. No, no, they run. We run two separate teams. Interesting. Well, that that gets me to my next question because you're talking about ballistic software. So Acra BLR 10B, uh, I got one early and loved it, and then I got one of your actual production models. And in my opinion, it's the best chassis. It's the best binoculars in that chassis as far as ranging yeah. optics. Uh, solutions. My question is, why not use a AB or you know Straylock or you know Forward Off? Why do you use your own ballistic software? So, have you used many uh, AB devices embedded? Embedded devices, not stuff that sends it out to the Kestrel, but actually embedded on the device. Just the Vortex. How, how fast do you feel your solutions are on that? I could make a fucking sandwich and then get the solution. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so 
from the very beginning, our algorithms have been optimized, right? So, so we've done stuff. We we own we've owned the the ballistic range finding space since 2011 when we introduced the first one that did a real time solution. Like, where was AB then? Actually, actually, Brian and I worked together on the solver for that, so it wasn't <laughs> AB back then. Gotcha. Um, but you look, if you look at the, the, the next-gen algorithms, we developed those for the Revic PMR. That scope had to click, right? So every click, it did a full ballistic solution in real time. So as fast as you could click that scope, we could calculate a solution. Gotcha. And it's a full solution. Like, it's, it's, it's all the sensors are there, all the corrections are there. Like, it's a full solution. So our, from the very beginning, our algorithm was developed to be optimized for embedded devices. And I think that's where we have some pretty strong specialty is in that aspect. So why would we use an inferior product? I mean, yeah, it's more popular in the marketplace, but is AB, does AB really have a better reputation than Gunworks does? No, I can't like think about do. think about think about some of the stupid shit we've seen recently. What happened when Hornady published the Ford off program and announced it? The first thing that happened was AB came out and said, "Poo poo, you don't need uh, Doppler radars. That's ridiculous." Wow, I didn't see that. Guess what? Guess what? Get, go. It's probably still on the forums. Go check it out. They were all out there, you know, trash talking. Hornady and how that was unnecessary, and guess what they have now? Well, I just shot Stop over it. Radar. Yeah, I just shot over it at that in the Night Force Challenge. Yeah, so so back up, back up to when Brian and I were together, which I mean, he's a super great guy, smart guy, right? Uh, we when we developed our system for the ballistic turrets, we basically set up a system where everybody trued their data, and then we would give you like a true BC, you know, in quotations. Uh, for that data, and now we would build this custom turret for you. And Brian and I used to get in arguments about truing. He's like, hey, look, if you have a good BC and you measure your velocity right, then you shouldn't have to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. But guess what all the AD solvers have now? Truing functions. Like, what? that was taboo back then. What so, what, what year was okay, that, Aaron? so again, this is a long time ago. This is 2000 and eight nine okay probably is when we were doing that okay so 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 again tell me why i would use ab what what is what's the advantage other than you know there's some popularity and you can get it on a really crummy like user interface product called a kestrel <laughs> why, why would it, why would why would we do that uh, good question. Do you? I got a question for you, and I've I've heard you talk about this as far as BCs. Why can't we have a Sammy kind of organization for BCs where we send they dude, send it? Dude, I, you want to get me on a fucking program? <laughs> it's like bring this up. I I made a document. I'll send it to you. It's called the Long Range Ballistics Association, and I went to every single bullet manufacturer and said, "Hey guys, I'm willing to fund the bulk of this project, and we're going to develop a standardized process to measure and report." Bullet drag functions. All I need from you is, I think I told them something like $2,000 a bullet to help offset some of the testing costs. We were providing all the equipment. We, we were, we were going to put up about a quarter million dollars to make this happen. And the outcome was publicly available algorithms and CD versus Mach number curves for every bullet. Guess how many bullet manufacturers wanted to sign on? I'm going to guess zero. Zero is the exact number. Hornady's got their thing. They're not going to help anybody else do anything else. Burger's got Brian List custom stuff. They're not going to freaking do it. Some of the other guys maybe weren't, you know, far thinking enough to realize what that meant. You just um, mentioned curves. You said you said CD versus something mock curve number. Say it again. Mock number. Mock number. CD okay, versus okay. mock number. Gotcha. And nobody. Yeah, and you could have done. You could have measured some of the other coefficients so that people that wanted to run Ford off algorithms, you could do that as well. But even just a CD versus not Mach number curve in a three degree freedom model is awesome. Like we do that shit all the time in our Revic algorithm. Interesting. 
No, I'm with you. That's a good explanation. Of well, why why do you drilling. think it is like when we go to this Night Force ELR challenge that, you know, there's there's 298 shooters there and there's 298 Kestrel 5700 Elite with Link? Why do you think that is? Uh, there's not, there's, there's not a more convenient package available. So when are you coming out with it? Dude, I actually made one about five, six years ago. It's an Android platform. And COVID literally freaking killed that thing, man. Yeah. It, it was right at that point where the supply chain disruption actually just shredded it. I, I should have them on the market in July. Okay. Like, in, oh. unless like there's a, this, a catastrophic, you know, failure that those should be on the market in July, but dude, they're five yeah. years old, you know, or four years old. And this is a, this is a so, handheld weather meter ballistic solver similar to the Kestrel. Yeah. Devin, and we're talking July next month or July next year. Yeah, yeah, July next month. Okay. What's the have a name yet? No, dude. And the <laughs> dangerous thing is the stoop. We we do these stupid internal names, and then they end up sticking. Well, what? So Come I, on, I, what's the internal what's name? The internal name? <laughs> Ballistic handheld device. Oh, BHC. Ugh, fancy I, name. I, that, <laughs> yeah, that's probably what it'll end up being called. BHD. It'll just, it'll just it'll it'll just stick. Can can, can Ryan and I get one of those to test? Yeah, absolutely. Badass. Um, probably, I could probably get you something that you can tool around with in a couple weeks, maybe. Nice. Here's on your binoculars. Here's a question I have. How come? Because I kept hearing all this. On, and I'm not knocking on Sig. I'm just saying the, the the Sig 10K. I get it. I look through it and I'm like, holy shit! I cannot hunt with this thing. It is so blue. Call them up. Their explanation is we had to have that to make a strong laser. Well, when I put your yeah. laser against their laser, you don't have the blue, but your laser's stronger. What's up with that? Yeah. Um, here's the true story. And, and so that display, that type of display, that active matrix display, it's awesome. So we, we, we were the first product in the world to feature one of these micro OLEDs in the PMR, the Reddit PMR. We actually halted our development and waited a year for this little startup company in France to, to, to get their prototypes done. And then we incorporated that into our PMR and we launched that. We were the first product out there with that product in the world. Hmm. Um, and every single optics company has been drooling over that Revic PMR product and, and trying to incorporate what they can from that product into theirs. So like that display tech is freaking cool. Now in the Revic PMR, we didn't occlude a display, so you can't see light through it. It doesn't pass light through it. And one of the weaknesses of that display, like for, for view through optics, is it doesn't have a lot of brightness intensity potential. And if you do crank it up, it just starts to burn up and you lose life. So, so the thing that's prevented us from using that type of display in view through optics, like through the display optics, like a binocular would, right? Because you're looking through that reflected image of the of the display, is the brightness and the intensity. So, in the if you'll you'll notice in the Revic BR4, if you've ever looked through one of those, our our display is very bright. Like nobody ever will complain about not being able to see that in any conditions. It, when you go to and it that that display probably has. 10 times the brightness output potential that those little micro OLEDs do. So you overdrive a micro OLED, and now what you have to do is, let's say it's a red OLED, what they do is you notch the coatings on the glass that comes in so that it doesn't let red come in. And, and what that does is it, is it makes the red in the display stand out and, and be more noticeable what that does to your image when you notch the red is it makes the image more blue mm. the other end of the spectrum and that's why that's why we we had that same issue in the first br2 product that we launched in like 2011 we actually had a little blue tint we had to do that so that you could see the display better and if you go read all the forms over all the years the only complaint that you will ever find about that original system was it was hard to see the display sometimes in the worst, you know, bright conditions. 
And so we, we continually worked on improving that over the BR2 and then the BR2500 product lines. And then when we launched the BR4, we actually had a whole new illumination system in there, which was pretty awesome. Now, I'm, I'm all for that active matrix. It's really cool. It's really flexible in the data that you can do. Like in our PMR, when we do over-the-air updates, we can change everything, like on the fly. Like we, we actually pioneered the over-the-air updates concept for sport optics as well. But in the, in the, the binocular, that is a fixed LED display. So that means every one of those characters is fixed. You can't change it. So we don't really get to update that. Now it's got numbers and seven segments. You can change the combination of segments, but it's not like an active matrix. Just so, but, you know, on a bino, you want it simple anyways. Like if you have too much information there for too long, it just it defeats kind of the, the preferred use uh, user interface on a binocular. Just make sure you uh, back up your ballistic profiles in the cloud or you could lose them. So I only did that once. I only did that once, and it will never happen again. We had to change the whole structure of the app, and it'll never happen again, I swear. But if you would have backed up your stuff to the cloud, you would have lost it. Anyway. I lost myself pissed, but I get it. You know, we all have our technological problems. We, were, we tried to email everybody. We tried to send them, you know, notices, and we you, knew it was going to happen. Actually, you did, and I didn't. I didn't read it, so I, I'll give you that. Okay. Okay. Let's get into the actual heart of the matter that we were trying to talk to you about. You know, fifty minutes in, we finally got here, and it's on match. This is probably the most debated topic on Rockslide, and it's still there's a bunch of I don't know if they're curmudgeons or old people yelling at clouds, but every time you bring up match bullets for hunting, it says they tell you right on the box it says right here not for hunting. So can you, and I know you're, you're well over 500 animals. I listen to all your stuff. Match bullets for hunting versus monos for hunting. Can you give me your spill, Aaron? Um, okay, let's just, let's define what success is. What's, what's success? What is success? Coming home with the animal. Perfect. Uh, back up just a little bit. What do we need to do to get success? You need to hit the animal in the right place. And the bullet needs to do what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. uh. Okay. So let's start let's start with um, hit the animal in the right place. What is the most significant thing that we can do to help, you know, all of us, you know, average people who aren't superstars hit the animal in the right place? We'll have a working weapon system, know how to use it, be practiced. Have a bullet that goes where it's supposed to yeah. go. Yeah. It, the simple thing is eliminate vertical so that you have predictable, solvable ballistic um, conditions. Right? So, in other words, when I dial to 850 yards, the bullet hits at 850 yards. Right? You don't have a bunch of vertical. So, you eliminate vertical. And then eliminate wind deflection. Mm -hmm. like this is where everybody gets schooled still is wind deflection. Right? So, better wind deflection means you know, better success. Okay. What's the most significant thing that we can do to a bullet to ensure that it does what it's supposed to do, which is make a hole big enough that the animal bleeds out and dies. Uh, make it Impact open up. Velocity. Yeah, yeah. Impact velocity. Okay. So what does a match bullet do versus any other bullet that is so significant? They yeah. shoot good, mm -hmm. right? So you eliminate your vertical. They have high DCs. So you, uh, you reduce your wind deflection as much as possible at long range, and they retain velocity so that it, it, you have higher impact velocities at distance. So what does, what does a mono do out of those three? It only gets one of them. They shoot good. Mm -hmm. it, fa it fails on the DC, which means it fails on the downrange velocity, and it fails on the reduce wind deflection. So if you're talking five, 600 yards is long range, fine. Mono's fine. If you're talking a thousand yards, 1200 yards, no way, no mono, no mono can do what we need to do at those distances. So if you're shooting zero to 600 yards, you'd be fine with shooting monos. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. They, I, I, I don't really like the way that they kill, but they kill. I mean, I shot an elk in, in California at 550 yards, smoked him, dropped him. We hiked all the way over there, got up there. He's still fine. Shot him again. Still wasn't dead. Had to shoot him again. Like, it just, because those bullets don't make massive, massive wound cavities, I don't think they, they bleed out as much. Like, like, I like the destruction you get from those match bullets that come apart. I think you just get more blood loss faster, so you just get a faster kill. So, so for what but, you but have, the monos seen, kill. Oh yeah, there's no doubt they kill. But from what you have seen, you think shot with monos, you know, they stay on their feet longer. Is that what you say? Oh, absolutely, no question. What no about question. Tur- what about turned solids as a mono that have the the longer form factor, high BC, extremely consistent? From they don't have high bullet. BCs. Well, they advertise that they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they advertise that they. Do. This goes back to the Sammy BC thing. <sighs> Um, You're always going to pay a massive ballistic penalty. You're always going to pay a massive ballistic penalty. So as soon as you know, as soon as you know, you're going to shoot 800 yards, it's automatically going to a match bullet. In my opinion, there's very few cartridges that drive a mono fast enough to, to make an 800 yard shot. Like legit. What about you're right on the, you're right on the, you're right on the threshold with, what about X versus M, hybrid target versus VLD Hunter? I mean, they're basically the same bullet construction BCs, all you the know, stuff the, that you're the, talking a about. Tip, a tipped bullet, a tipped bullet, and a non tipped bullet have completely different behaviors. I've and li- you have to realize that because you got to be careful with your shots on a tipped match bullet. They, the bullets expand very quickly. You do not want to take that on the shoulder shot with a tipped match bullet. It might work. But there's a very, very high probability of a problem. So I'm pulling off, I'm pulling back, and I'm going double lung generally. If I'm shooting a VLD or a hybrid target, they're, they all are pretty much the same. Um, I can take any shot on any bone, on any structure, from any angle. You made the statement before that the hybrid, the, sorry, the, the burger VLD is a super hard bullet, and you actually compared them to bonded bullets. Is that just because it takes a while for that hard copper, you know, uh, hollow noise, nose to collapse? Is that is that why? Say that again. Okay, so Give you said VLDs, Burger VLDs, you've said are, are almost as hard as like a bonded bullet. Is that just because it takes that hard copper hollow nose a while to collapse when it goes into an animal? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, if you think think about it this way, think about the plaster can expose lead tips very very soft compared to copper. Like they're they're the plastic ones either fall out or get smashed. You look at the diameter of the surface of the bullet without the tip, and look at the diameter of the surface of a of a VLD type bullet, and the work that you can do. Right is dependent on the force that you apply and the amount of time that you apply it. Right. So let's say it takes a certain amount of work to deform the copper. That that bigger area is very very significant in in speeding up the time it takes to do that work. Um, that's that's the primary function. The secondary function is the fact that there is there is more copper in that tip than in the, you know, that the tip of the, you know, the tipped bullet without the tip in it. Did that, yep. did that make sense? I might have uh, said tip too many times. <laughs> what, what, what do you think about eight tips for killing since we're talking about plastic tips? Why not? We have a... Now, they're going to behave, they're going to, they're going to behave just like the um, VLDs where you're more likely to tumble the bullet and make a wound cavity that way than you are. Uh, the ELD match where the tip disappears and it expands and makes a big hole. It's interesting because you, I've seen seven animals shot with a tips and it's either uh, they do that tumbling or they just zip on through. They're, they seem very unpredictable to me. Have you seen anything like that? Well, they, they zip on through, 
But is it the tip that goes through first or the butt of the bullet that goes through first? Well, that's an interesting question. You bring that up because you're the only other person that I've ever heard outside of a guy we have on Rock Slide that talks about tumbling. And like the, we've shot a lot of ammo with the, the 115 D tack nose ring and it snaps mm. up, tips off, and it, it is dramatic. Oh, yeah. It is devastating oh, yeah. tumbler. No, no, no. No, it's cool. No, it's good. That, I. Frickin' Dave Tubb always comes up with these frickin' good ideas, and that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, that's so, a good idea. So you're thinking, like, on the, the VLD side of it, that is breaking apart at a different, you know, if it, you know, it tends on flesh and bone. So the left side might snap off, and it might flip the bullet backwards. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. We, usually what happens, like, the, the bullet's unstable going through tip first. Mm-hmm. But if you put if you do it through butt first, now it's now it, it adopts a different type of stabilization profile, which is called shoulder stabilization, and that flat nose actually stabilizes the bullet. Really? So so that bullet once it turns around backwards, it's stable. It'll go through straight. That's like every dangerous game gun with a flat nose on it uses that same function, that shoulder stabilization, to penetrate straight through where you're aiming. Like when they shoot a big buffalo or an elephant, that bullet doesn't turn sideways like we're used to with a tipped bullet. Like it literally comes out like a straight line on the other side. Have you seen a big difference between like the Burger VLD or the hybrid target? Because the hybrid target is supposed to be a little thicker jacket. Yes, but we also see a big difference between like a 168 VLD and a 180 VLD. Like so... I don't know how much of that is from target jacket thickness and how much of it's just from, you know, different sectional densities. Uh, if you, there was a company in Glen Rock, what was their name? They were doing Hawk, Hawk bullets, I think. Mm-hmm. And they actually would do bullets and you could specify the jacket thickness to manipulate the behavior of the bullet. So yes, I do think there is some aspect of that that has value. The most killing bullet, ever in the history of Gunworks is 168 VLD. Absolutely just devastating. I thought you said it was the 140 the was... VLD. No? Oh, shit. No, the, the 140 <laughs> is a freaking killer, though. <laughs> but, dude, we are all on board with that 168. It's a it's a smasher. We've killed so many elk, so many shoulder shots on elk with that thing. I, I've had great luck with the match bullets from Hornady. I, I, I The last maybe probably five years that's been kind of my go-to bullet that 180 grain and a seven but i just have to be a little bit more careful you watch our show you saw less like animals drop because mm-hmm. I, I started shooting off the shoulder moved away from that high shoulder shot just a little bit if you know you were hunting in like semi you know forested would you change to a vld move away from that match if you're gonna have to take a non-broadside shot Mm, I don't think so, man. I don't think so. Those freaking bullets are devastating. You shoot an animal in the hip, like you're going to do so much more trauma than, you know, what happens if you've got your mono bullet and you just clip a piece of muscle and you don't grab bone? You're just going to do a little wound, right? You do that with a burger, it comes apart. You're going to just, you're going to freaking get shrapnel over into the artery, like, or a hornady, same difference. Like I, I would, I would still, even in that case, I'm still probably a burger fan. All right. And it's not a brand thing. It's like, a, I, let me, let me rephrase that. It's, it's a boat tail hollow point. So Hornady's boat tail hollow point, the earth boat tail hollow points, burgers, VLDs, burgers, hybrids, they're all kind of the same product. We classify that type of bullet, all those bullets in one classification. And we just call it the VLD type just because burger pioneered the, popularity of it but or maybe i could say we pioneered the popularity of that bullet or burger mm-hmm. is there any interest in gunworks making a bullet it's a little bit out of our ballywick you know mm-hmm. it, it's a little out of our ballywick so that's not a no but a lot of things would have to come together just right to make something happen it's really hard like, dude, we're start. We we we're, we're not going to load the ELD match bullet anymore. Hornady's making ammo that's so good right now that we're just switching all of that stuff over to like anybody wants a Hornady ELD match, they just we're going to sell them Hornady ammo. 
Are you doing your group, your seven shot group with match ammo, with factory match ammo? Yeah. If, if that's what they pick. Yeah. Yeah. You must've done it with mine. Cause it is a tack driver. What is your cartridge of choice, Aaron, for hunting? You know, I, I've always been a seven LRM guy. Like I, I killed a lot of stuff with the seven mag. We improved it to that seven LRM in 2010, 2011. And I've shot that ever since. I've, tr- I've dabbled into the 28 nozzler and came back. You know, I've tried a couple things. I always came back. I, I am a big supporter of the 7 PRC. I mean, it's essentially, it duplicates our 7 LRM. And I, I'm very hopeful that it, it's ex- as successful as I think it will be. And I kind of have been pushing over to that cartridge. So that's, that's probably where I land. Nice. You've kind of touched on this before in a few podcasts, but how much does recall matter for a first round hit and a follow up shot? And I mean that is like, I don't want to bring, you know, AB back, but like if you run it through the Wes calculator, you can kind of see that. But from a practical, you know, experienced shooter, you, I know you're not I, a big thirty. I just, I just told, I just told you, told you the answer. I tried twenty eight Nosler, and I, even though on paper it like it's a killer, it's a smasher, mm-hmm. I came back smaller. Because that level of recoil in the weight of guns we like to carry when we're hunting, it is not conducive to that calling your shot and getting a follow-up. And, you know, not every hunting situation needs that. But if you're shooting at 800 yards or 1,000 yards and, you're, and you think that it's not important to have that capability and to be ready, then you are going to make a mess one of these days. Why not a six five or six millimeter? Just BC wise, is that the reasoning? There, there is. I'm not a big cartridge guy. I really am not. I like the six five, and I hunt with those. And I we should, we used to hunt a lot with the six XC. There, you just hit this limit where you push into that eight hundred nine hundred yard range. You just you start running out of. And I hate to say the word energy because I don't, I'm not a big believer in that, but you just start running out of the juice Mm -hmm. that makes you feel like those low velocity impacts are still going to make the wound cavity that you need. I mean, we've had success with elk with six fives at a thousand yards all day long. As I've, as I've developed more technology and better systems and a little bit more capability, like I want to be able to shoot an elk at 1200 yards. And I think that that thousand yards is about the threshold where I just, in my experience, I feel like you start running out of the steam that a 140 or 50 grain bullet provides in the 6.5. I, I think you could kill it. I just feel like you start to get into the margins. Hmm. You know what's funny? It's like I have so much experience with the 7. I have a lot of confidence. You know, maybe only 10 or 15% of the animals I've killed have been with a 6.5. Speaking of that, what is what maybe, is your? Maybe, go ahead. I guess maybe that's maybe it's just a confidence and experience thing. What is your longest shot on an animal, and what what uh, cartridge was it? The longest one. We'll talk about the longest one where I learned about limits was my son shot his first elk at thirteen seventy six with a seven rim mag. Like we're way beyond that the, threshold. The one velocity. with like eight million views. Yeah. So. Yeah. That, that bullet did not do what it needed to do at that distance. And what so bullet? I, I, you know, the, it was a 168 VLD. Uh-huh. Just, we were 1,500, 1,600 feet per second. You need to have 1,900 to 2,000 on a VLD. An ELD match, you can have, you know, 1,600 to 1,800. 16 is a little low. You know, 17, 1,800 you can do. Impact velocity. That's, mm-hmm. your, that's how you gauge it. Mm-hmm. What, so what was yours? Uh, I've shot some animals over a thousand and, gotcha. you know, I've I try to follow those rules that we set up, you know, but sometimes you want to test a few things and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, make sure that those hypotheses are correct. And, you know, I'm not a really big trophy hunter, so that's not never been as that big of a factor, but. Yeah, and you said you liked that. You lately you've brought it closer. You like the seven to eight hundred yard shots, which I totally agree with. Yeah, 
I can shoot pretty good at 700. <laughs> <laughs> On your sunshot, would an ELDM been better choice? I mean, if it was, I don't think it existed yeah, then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 100, 180 grain ELDM and a 7LRM or 7PRC, absolutely. That's an absolute inside of the inside of the envelope. All right. Well, we've got one more question to let you go. What What's new outside the BHD? What's new? Dude, we've got a new bipod coming. You're going to see that about middle of July, probably see the BHD middle of July. There should be a rifle scope uh, from Revic that's a non-electronic, you know, non-smart scope. It's just got some cool features on it. You should see that probably maybe before July, but right in there. Um, this fall, you're going to see the Gen 2 PMR in a, a product lineup of those. So lots of new stuff there. I already messed around with your bipod, and uh, I like it. Yeah, should be good. Should be good. There's some trade-offs when you do really ultra-lightweight stuff that always kind of bug me, but overall, it's got some cool features. I'm pretty happy with it. Jake, we miss anything? All good. It was nice talking with you, Aaron. You bet. Thanks for inviting me on. All right, if you want to get a hold of us, get a hold of us at podcast at shoottohunt.com, and thanks for listening.